Welcome viewers right throughout New Zealand and across the Tasman Sea in Australia. We're at Hampton Downs for the inaugural race of the V8 Super Tourers. Well, what was just a vision 12 months ago is now here in colour, size and noise as reality bites at Hampton Downs. The circuit located equidistance between Auckland and Hamilton here on the North Island of New Zealand. And this is a proud moment for New Zealand Motorsport as eight Ford and eight Holden V8 Super Tourers get set to do battle for the very first time. And the weather could not be better as a bumper crowd is in the house here waiting for this debut race, the first of three taking place during the weekend. As we look at the cars on the grid and the track, a fantastic venue here at Hampton Downs, 2.63 kilometres, six corners, one kink making it seven changes of direction and a huge elevation change going around this circuit, specifically down into turn number one. And the circuit that was fantastic here this morning in great trim for qualifying as we look at the front row of the grid. And Kane Scott was the man who did all the business this morning. And there is a reflection of qualifying early today. All holding front row, Scott and Murphy there, supported on the next row of the grid by Andy Booth and Scott McLaughlin, the fast man yesterday. First of the Fords is Johnny Reed, and then Andy Knight alongside him in position six. I'm Gartner in seven, Pedersen in eight. And on the fifth row of the grid, it's Eddie Bell and Steve Richards. Positions 11 and 12, Craig Bird with work to do, and Richard Moore alongside him. Then it's John McIntyre and Paul Manuel sitting on the next row of the grid. And rounding out the final eighth row is Jeff Emery and Colin Corkery. Dramas for Colin this morning. And there are the cars sitting there on the grid awaiting their, their observation lap. And then, of course, the single warm-up lap and the flying rolling start. And we go on board. Paul Manuel on board cameras in this car. Four cars carrying on board shots for us here today and Paul Manuel in the Oryx sponsored machine from further back on the grid than he would have expected. Position number 13 looking to move up. Greg Murphy, the Murph, four-time Bathurst winner, second on the grid. Had a moment this morning with a spin at turn six with some steering related issues. We're looking out through the front of the car sponsored by Mike Perot Mortgages and then John McIntyre from well down the order. An uncustomarily low position for John McIntyre, the three-time New Zealand V8 champion. And he'll be one to watch, won't he, when we go racing over 20 laps of this 2.6-kilometre circuit. And there's the shot looking forward. Many cars to pass, and that's Craig Beard immediately in front of John McIntyre. Well, there it is, 16 cars split equally between Holden and Ford. And Mark Pedersen joining me in commentary box. So Mark, really is a sense of occasion here, isn't it? It's been 12 months in the making, but finally we go about to go racing here for the V8 Super Tourers. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. And I must say it is just such a magnificent sight and achievement by all concerned to get to this point here. Like you say, this show is just amazing. This Hampton Downs venue has really turned it on. Mother Nature, of course, she's played her part as well. So as you say, 20 laps and we're getting much wiser, aren't we? I feel like I'm in Melbourne. The more they forecast rain, the more the sun seems to beam down. Let's hope this continues throughout the weekend because I'm sure we'll get an even bigger crowd here tomorrow. Kane Scott, what a job he did this morning. A disrupted qualifying session. We had two red flags uh, flown during the course of it, but Kane Scott not only went to pole early before the first red flag, bounced back again later on to put it out of reach. He did just keep backing it up and backing up, didn't he? And, and we thought there at one stage, you know, maybe the train of thought could have been broken and we're expecting some of the other guys to charge through, but Kane had us, top, uh, had us place at the top of the timesheets and well done, but this man here, Greg Murphy, he's got all the hard work to do. And Chris, keep in mind, this is a rolling start. First time Greg Murphy has probably ever done a rolling start, certainly in New Zealand. I've been trying to find him actually uh, mid-session. A lot of sponsorship commitments he needed to attend to and also a chance for some quiet time. But I can't recall, and I was talking to some of the guys in the media centre, when Greg would have done a rolling start. He certainly hasn't done one for many, many years, and that may well be a challenge. But I'm sure it's just like a restart to him. There's <laughs> Ant Pedersen in one of the Falcons here. And that's the sister car to the car being driven by Johnny Reed out of International Motorsport, the operation run by Lyle and Nick Williamson. And, geez, a leggy boy, isn't he? Yeah. He's, uh, in fact, he's just having a rest there. But Ant Pedersen did pretty well to qualify in position number eight earlier today. So he's in the front half of the field and a driver that uh, he's no relation, but he's obviously a quick steerer and uh, a driver to keep an eye on, I'm sure. Certainly. I actually had a chance to speak to him uh, earlier in the activities here and he said he really hasn't come to one with this car yet and he's still trying to work out how to get the best out of it and he probably related it closer to the GT3 Porsche uh, than the, the supercar that he's been campaigning in Australia in the development series of course so look a lot of these guys are coming from different pedigrees different backgrounds of course so what they can relate it to best I don't know but at the end of the day only one man is going to be uh, crossing the finish line first is it going to be Kane Scott Greg Murphy or one of the other 14 guys time's going to tell well they all want to 
draw first blood, don't they, and have the first victory. Kane Scott, the first pole position. Yesterday's fast man, Scott McLaughlin, on the second row of the grid. Gearbox changed Brand Pedersen just to go back to that car and uh, the Bank Link sponsored machine. It's had some problems with the downshift in that car since they started testing it last Friday. So they've just taken a precautionary change and put a new Quake six speed sequential box into that car as the drivers take off on the warm up lap. Distinctly different driving style, these cars, to a lot of the styles of previous cars, be it the previous New Zealand V8 program or Carrera Cup and even the V8 supercars, they are slightly different. It's taking some drivers a little bit of time to adapt. Oh, it is. And of course, there's so much to learn. It's a brand new tyre. It's a different torque configuration that a lot of these guys have been driven from before. We've got a six-speed sequential gearbox now as the old cars that a lot of the guys used to campaign here, of course, are only four-speed. So what they've essentially said is let's throw everything we've ever learned about the New Zealand series in the past right out the window and we've really got to re-educate ourselves again. But Kane Scott, look, I don't think there's anything in it. Just warming up the rear tyres, probably generating a lot of heat. One thing Kane does, Chris, just for your own reference and everybody else out there, he tries to generate a lot of tyre temperature by using the brakes. He gets the brakes as hot as he can. He tries to transfer that through to the tyre. Now, we're probably that's what we've seen, but of course, this is a 20-lap race. Even the duration is, is new for a lot of these guys. So, as I say, it's a big afternoon. Yeah, well, he caught a few napping, didn't he, this morning? The car didn't even run in yesterday's first practice session. And uh, Kane Scott is out there now warming the tyres up, bounced back with that pole position earlier today. And one of the veterans in the field, it's really a battle of the youngsters and some of the wily veterans because Greg Murphy is in his 40th year, turns 40 later in the year. John McIntyre, probably in the middle of being a youngster and a veteran, but we have 16-year-old Andre Heimgartner, we have 18-year-old Scott McLaughlin, and they're all looking to take it up to these multiple champions and so many race wins in so many different categories. The most impressive stat I've seen is there is eight former New Zealand Grand Prix winners in this field. Uh, that's one stat I didn't know and it's, it's something else, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed. As the cars are now completing what will be their first of the observation and warm-up laps before the safety car will determine the pace. And then around a second gear, 100 kilometre an hour start. Rolling start, of course. New for some drivers in the field. Commonplace for many of the others. And 20 lap journey beckoning the first race of three, making up this first round of the V8 Super Tours. Of course, a seven round program, four sprint rounds and three endurance races to close out the season later in the year. And fair to say, by the time we come back to this circuit, I'd estimate we'll find a second in performance, at least from these cars. They're going very quickly now, but they will find time the more and more familiar they become with each of these car setups. Exactly right, it's evolution. And this is really just chapter one of a very long book that we're about to be written. This magnificent class we've got here. And the teams, albeit they've done a little bit of testing, they're still coming to terms with the car. The drivers are still coming to terms with the car. The drivers are actually coming to terms with the teams as well. So look, for the fact we've got 16 cars on the grid right now and everything that's to be learnt, like you say, the time is going to be coming next time we visit Hampton Downs, but what we can say is at the moment this is just going to be a magnificent show. I don't know about you, mate, my right leg here is actually bouncing in the commentary box. I've got goosebumps. I'm just so excited about this. Yeah, you should be, and uh, we all are, and uh, a great crowd sitting up there on the hill as well. It's a very unique facility having the apartments in the background as well, which I'm fortunate enough to be staying here in here this weekend, and the view from up there is fantastic. You can almost see the entire circuit from any one vantage point, and it's a combination of what I'd call medium speed corners and a couple of slow hairpins, and that very, very quick final corner in third or even fourth gear as they come onto the start finish straight, and that's the corner that we see the cars exiting now, and a lot of cars getting quite sideways there under power this morning. There has been a change in the combined weight for car and driver, and some people are complaining that the excessive amounts of fuel they've had to put on board in order to balance the cars has actually changed the balance from what it was yesterday. Yeah, and one of those people I was talking to about that was Johnny McIntyre, and you know, I asked the question of Johnny, your car looked terrible during qualifying, and he goes, well, what happened is, like you said, Chris, they've increased the, uh, the weight of the, of the minimal weight of the racing weight. The only way they could actually balance those up uh, in such a short period of time was uh, add additional fuel. And now, might not sound a big deal to everybody out there, but what you're doing is you're putting fuel in the worst part of the car because it's actually over the rear axle line where the fuel tanks are loaded, so it upsets the whole balance. And what he was saying is that they haven't thrown every bit of information away they've gathered over the last two or three tests, but probably at least 30 or 40% of it they have to go back and re reinvent again. So, look, they're going to try something a bit different in that car and in Stephen Richards' car and hope they can make some gains, but they see this race one is certainly going to be a bit of a challenge for them. Well, the series point score has already kicked off because 70 points awarded to pole man Scott earlier, earlier on. Greg Murphy, 63, Booth in 57. So valuable points up for grabs. First time we've seen that in uh, any category I can remember, awarding 70 points from first down to 10th and many more points available at the end of the race. Well, they look like they're neighbouring cousins from across in Australia, the V8 supercars, but they are discernibly different. This is a control formula, a specification formula 
all identical engines, identical shock absorbers, gearbox, diff. The only things you can change are tyre pressures, marginal rye height, small amount of aerodynamics, and you have two adjustments you can make on the shock absorber. So it's a genuine driver's formula, and it's also an affordable formula. These cars have been built to a stringent cost containment program in order to reflect the economy of the country and also the affordability of the drivers looking to move up. Fantastic initiative as we finally go racing after 12 months of waiting. It's four Holdens in the top group waiting for the safety car to pull off and then from second gear and around 100 kilometres an hour with all this torque on board, will we see wheel spin from any of these cars? And it's time to go racing with Scott and Murphy mirror to mirror as they roll towards the start finish line. It's blue and red, Murphy and Scott as we head down to wave off this first event and we're underway. And Scott, a great start. Booth looking to go up the inside of Murphy there and cleanly into turn one with Murphy on the outside. It's a third gear, camber enhancing corner, but you can run out of road on the exit. And Scott pulls it off for the moment, all cleanly through. 16 cars now. We go into this flip-flop of right and left through turns two and three. The cars get light as they unload here on the exit of this corner. See them wiggling around as the power comes down and Booth's looking pretty racy. Yeah, look, Booth's already jumped up to second place there. He knows he's got to uh, fight hard, fight hard with the very first lap. And it's the only way that we know he knows how to race. All the cars going wide, two or three abreast there. But look, Greg Murphy a little bit conservative on the opening lap, you have to say, a bit of gaggle cars there. McLaughlin's starting to get a bit impatient. He's so, he's lost it, he's around. And Booth's past Scott too, going into that uh, dipper hairpin as they call it. So a lot of action in the top order of the field there. And Scott and Booth had actually broken away from Murphy as he now moves up a further spot. So we said it was going to be a category of racing and it's on for young and old. McLaughlin, the big loser, is at the rear of the field, but Andy Booth, who started in position three, crosses the line to complete the first of 20 laps in the Woodstock Bourbon sponsored Commodore. From third to first he goes, and it's the two hard heads in Murphy and Scott battling on the run down to turn one. I think it's uh, probably been a factor so far of lap one. Andy Booth, of course, started there. He's now winning the race. Craig Beard has actually made big roads as well, up to sixth place. So a lot of hard charging in their laps. But Kane Scott had to say, through turns one to four, he had the race under control. Then Andy Booth just come out in front of him. Well, cold tyres, of course, and these cut tyres have been very durable over the distance. It's the Hankook Ventus F200 tyre, and they really have been a very good tyre throughout, throughout the testing and practice, but perhaps a little bit of cold tyre caution there concertina the field back, and we saw Booth pass Scott, Murphy doing the same thing, and we noticed the right uh, side window on uh, the car of Scott is just starting to flail about as well, so perhaps that wasn't quite seated before the start of the race. McLaughlin, the big loser, was turned around going into that very tight second gear corner, a corner that he's been talking about loving all the weekend, well perhaps no longer as Andy Booth, with comfortable margin, crosses the line, Holden, Holden, Holden in the top three, the first of the forwards is Johnny Reed moving up in car number two ahead of Knight, Baird, Heimgartner, Bell and John McIntyre now up into position number nine, remember of course, eight now, that car started in position 13. He did so far, but Andy Booth, his first flying lap, a 1 minute 6.0. Next guy close to him is actually, uh, let me see here, Andy Knight on a, a 6.5, so he's got 6 tenths of a second already per lap on the rest of the field, so one thing to be careful of, Chris, is that he doesn't gain too much of a lead because then he'll go into conservation mode and he may be a hard man to pick back. We've seen him in the past, this guy knows how to win races and championships for that matter, so look, he's going to be ears backed. He's doing a great job. Rich, Steve Richards also at the back of the field there, so he was obviously caught up in something earlier on, and he's some eight seconds or so behind Scott McLaughlin sitting in the second last spot, briefly then on board with John McIntyre. The car's getting very sideways on the exit of the slower corners. I just wonder whether the driver's in race mode now. They're just stabbing at the throttle a bit more aggressively than they were in practice and qualifying and creating that oversteer condition. So Andy Booth, a comfortable couple of seconds to the good of Murph in car number 51, the number that he's used for so long and so successfully. It was strange to see him in a different numbered car back in Australia last year in car 11. And the gap now out to 3.3 seconds. And look at Scott harrowing the back of the Mike Perot sponsored machine of Murphy's. Complained about steering angle issues this morning. Talked with Steve Giles, the team manager there in this 3M Motorsport Equip. That's a pretty complicated name. It's Murphy, Manuel and more. That's where the 3Ms come from. And he's coming under siege, isn't he, now from Kane Scott, the wily veteran in the car that's done the least amount of miles of any car in this field. Started out of pole position and right behind Scott. Isn't Johnny Reid doing a good job? The youngster in car number two ahead of Andy Knight. So it's a Holden Trio and a pair of Fords in the top five spots. Right, I'm going to go on a bit of a limb here, Chris, and I say the reason I think Andy Booth, other than his driving style, why he's a second lap quicker than anybody else, 
one, he's in, there's no traffic in front of him, and two, everybody else is racing in traffic. They haven't done that so far uh, over the course of the weekend, and certainly not in practice. So, as we know, when one car gets close to another, it loses that front downforce. Maybe that's why we've seen some of the cars in the comments you made about going a little bit wide. Maybe it's just upsetting the aero balance a little bit. Certainly that window on Kane Scott's car coming out won't be doing him any favours whatsoever. So, like we say, it's all new to him, but really the only one that has an advantage is, is Andy Booth, because he is, like he's in practice, he's by himself. He's dominating the race, isn't he, Andy Booth? Really doing a great job, the 37-year-old North Shore boy from Auckland. And he's just set a fast lap, 159 last lap. Sorry, his fast lap, 105.67. And that's still three tenths of a second to the good of the next fastest driver in the field. So the gap, a static three seconds plus. We're looking at Johnny Reed in that beautiful looking international motorsport car. It's reminiscent of the four performance racing vehicles with the Falcon head on the side of it. There it is on screen, car number two. And right behind him, the Gulf Century sponsored machine of Andy Knight. A couple of open wheeler exponents here, both with fantastic racing pedigrees. And great to see Johnny Reed really acquitting himself well to this car. One of the later drivers to announce his plans for 2012. And there is the car we're talking about, resplendent in that black, silver and blue colours. And it's Andy Knight right behind him. And Craig Baird's also moved through, unseen by us. So Baird up from 11th to 6th, so don't ever discount that man. Multiple race winning in so many categories, a multiple champion. If we started reading his racing resume out now, we'd still be going on lap 20. And Craig Baird sitting in position number six ahead of Eddie Bell. Heimgartner still eight, Pedersen and McIntyre up into 10th spot. These guys are all starting to try to find their feet now because Andy Booth's last lap time was a 1 minute 6.3. Uh, Greg Murphy is currently second place was one minute 5.8. So the, the lap times are seesawing at the moment, aren't they? Just when you think one guy, like we said about Andy Booth, was going to start pulling away, all of a sudden he drops a few tenths there and it allows Greg Murphy to get back on the back. So Andy would want to do that for another two or three laps because rest assured once Murphy gets a bit of a sniff of uh, Andy Booth and Andy starts seeing that big old red Commodore coming up behind him. They start going to defence mode pretty early but he'll get the teams here looking on. Some looking concerned. Some probably don't know what to think at all. Yes, well, of course, Andy Booth's car. It's a team managed by Wayne Anderson and his crew chief come uh, engineer is Craig Russell. He has ex-Formula 3 experience from Alan Docking Racing. And I just wonder whether the, these cars, uh, particularly to the liking of the ex-open wheeler drivers, because at 2.9 seconds to the good of Greg Murphy, Booth can start to control the race a little bit. They have completed their last lap now and it's lap number seven. Well, so. sorry mate, just saying that, uh, Greg Murphy last lap time at 165.7, Andy Booth at 66.4, so it's another seven tenths of a second. So, Greg Murphy now on a charge, but what he's going to do, he's going to drag Kane Scott with him as well. So, Andy, have a look at the revision mirror, young man, because these boys are fast approaching. Could be a tyre pressure thing, perhaps they've pressured those tyres very aggressively to come up quite quickly as they rise in temperature, they rise in grip, and perhaps Andy Booth's team aggressive on tyre pressures, they've got that lead. As you said, they went up to 3.4 seconds, back to 3.3, now 2.2, as we look forward out of Greg Murphy's car, the glorious sounding control 7 litre all aluminium V8 in these cars. 575 horsepower, but the torque is the impressive part. They have so much torque, they could pull a stump out of the ground as we see Greg Murphy exiting the final corner now, and he really can start to smell the fumes of the car of Andy Booth as they cross the line that time through. And Greg Murphy's time, all but matched by Booth, uh, that time throughs, but still, the gap is now down to 1.9 seconds as we look back through the field. Actually, Chris, you may have come up on something there. All the way through, we've heard how good this Hancock tyre is and how durable it is. It keeps going and going. But the other factor, and this is, of course, tyre pressures, and tyre pressures can cause, you know, the car start moving around. Now, when the tyre pressures get up, is it going to be more like a supercar with the tyre degradation? And is that going to come in Greg Murphy's favour, hence what we've seen at this stage of the race? Well, the thing is, they've never run this close for so long. During the course of testing and practice, mainly five to six lap stints before they came in and made changes. So we're really going into uncharted territory now as we complete multiple laps. The cars following closely behind each other creates more temperature. We're looking at Paul Manuel here. Eyes on in that car as we go into the footwell of this CNC machine pedal box and the foot is hard to the floor there and it's a delicate balancing act isn't it with all this horsepower there's John McIntyre on screen and there's the car we were riding with a moment ago the Paul Manuel Oryx car so it could well be that somebody has a, a very good setup over a sustained duration others may well have knife edge speed and is it Booth that's starting to struggle from that at the moment because Murph now down to 1.6 seconds behind the car of Andy Booth Kane Scott's dropped off a little bit Reed is still next ahead of Knight and 
Yes, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out because it is a voyage of discovery as we look at the Mike Pero real estate sponsored machine of Greg Newton. How about this track? Lively is the best way to describe it. It's not slow, it's not fast, it's got a little bit of everything and a lot of up and down. You need to be very delicate out of the second gear corners. Here we are coming up now into the hairpin at turn number five. Very, very late apex there. You see the car just hitting the apex. Not much exit curve there as we see Greg Murphy heading down towards turn number six. Visor just partially open there, so quite warm within the cockpit of this car. And this is a tough corner, this one. It's very flat in camber. It is a multiple apex corner. Many drivers choose to hug in the middle of that corner. But Greg Murphy across the start finish line to complete yet another lap. So completing another lap through. And Andy Booth now down to 1.4 seconds behind the man on screen. Greg Murphy chasing him down. And doesn't he want the first victory here for this new category? He did it at Pukekohe when the V8 supercars first came to New Zealand. Three from three. And it was really the king of the mountain. He was crowned, of course, during the course of the first Pukekohe V8 supercar event. Wouldn't he love to score the first victory here in front of an adoring home crowd? It'd be a popular win. But there's a man in front of him who will have the widest Woodstock bourbon Commodore you've ever seen. But it almost looks like a matter of time. We're at half distance now, and the gap has come down two seconds in the last four laps. Booth, Murphy, Scott, Reed, all on screen. It's great to see how close these cars are racing each other around this 2.6k circuit. It certainly has been very clean and methodical racing so far, hasn't it? But this is battle is in picture right now. Andy Booth, currently man in front of the Woody Woodstock car. And then Greg Murphy now, last time there was only 0.2 of a second difference in overall lap speed between the two. What have we got this time round? Andy Booth for 65.7, Greg Murphy is 65.1. It is down to 0.8 of a second. We don't even have to comment on any how close it is, Chris. You can see it visibly. Greg Murphy, he is the man on the mission now, isn't he? Andy Booth, he is the man being hunted. I think it's tyres because we just saw coming out of turn number one there, Greg Murphy's car, a lot of aggressive animation as the car rolled to the exit of the corner, whereas Andy Booth looked like he was walking a tightrope saying, I don't want to get this car sideways at all. Another good battle is the battle for the final spot on the podium and Johnny Reed flying the flag for the Ford fans in fourth spot. Would love to relieve Kane Scott of the current third place that he's occupying behind those two night and bed bed up to six now fantastic and scott mclaughlin's recovered up into 11th after that opening lap incident stephen richards up to 15th and heimgarten unseen by us is all the way at the tail of the field yeah there were some there was some reports actually that uh, the, the 22 car of heimgarten was under investigation here for a drive through penalty but here we go the battle was on as you said all the way through greg murphy would like nothing better than stand on the top part of the podium after race one of this magnificent first ever race for these super touring cars but the one I feel sorry for believe it or not is Kane Scott because he's going to look in his mirror and he's going to see uh, Johnny Reid there and he thinks well Johnny Reid might back off for a lap this guy in picture now he does not know how to back off not even for one meter off any lap at all he's just going to keep charging it way and away at Kane and if Kane does make a mistake rest assured he'll be there but talking about mistakes Andy Booth if you make one car behind you which is by our very own full-time bathroom. Greg Murphy, he's got him, has he, Chris? Not yet, <laughs> but he's got a great run, hasn't he? And this is the power down part that matters. It's a side-by-side -side drag race on to run to turn five. You won't do it around the outside there because the track dives away, drops some four or five metres. Well, if he can stay there, he's got the inside. No, you're dead right. I thought if he could stay there, he's got the inside running for turn six, but... This is what we wanted, isn't it? We wanted a true battle at the front between some of the bigger names in the sport. And we're looking at two right now. Andy Booth, the winner of the New Zealand Grand Prix, winner of the New Zealand Motor Cup, twice V8 champion here. And Greg Murphy, four times Bathurst winner and the driver who just never lays down despite his slowly maturing age. And the crowd are roaring in the background as the top two drivers go into battle. And it's not just the crowd getting tense. And Murphy does it into one. Can he pull that car up? Because Booth will try to duck into the apex and does so side by side as they lay black strips of hand cooked rubber on the exit of turn number one. Now what these guys have got to be very careful of is that the battle for third and fourth, Kane Scott, Johnny Reed, they will be on these guys in the blink of an eye. Now, Greg Murphy, can he hold it? Can he hold that position? I think he's got it done now. What a great battle, all but one lap. One complete lap that lap uh, that race star battle started. And Greg Murphy pulls it off now. And Andy Booth still not taking it laying down, is he? He wants to score the win as well. And Kane Scott has certainly reduced that margin visibly back to the car of Andy Booth. And Johnny Reed must only be about two and a half seconds covering the top four as we look backwards. The man that leads the motor race. 
soon to turn 40, but he's no slower than he was when he was 14 with that wild style he had in carts where he almost looked like he was going to fall out of the seat. But Greg Murphy is exiting the final corner on this lap with Andrew Booth still hanging on in the exhaust fumes. Kane Scott not far away. It's been a very good opening stanza here thus far. Plenty more miles to go. And as Murphy perhaps asked too much of his tyres in that battle with Andrew Booth, and look at the cars unloading as they turn down in that very unique turn one. Reminds me almost of the run down to Druid's Hill hairpin at Brands Hatch in the United Kingdom, as does the amphitheatre field in front of the apartments and villas there. Murphy, Booth and Kane Scott almost equidistant apart as we complete another lap of this 20 lap motor race. Can't help but think Kane Scott's actually got a sniff of the action here because last lap time, uh, Greg Murphy a 66.2, Andy Booth a 67.0, Kane Scott a 65.9. So 1.8, 1.28 seconds separates first to third. And Johnny Reed, he'll be there in a the blink of an eye as well. So do you agree, maybe in a lap or so, we're going to see maybe three, if not a four horse race? Yeah, I, I do. I, I mean, I just wonder whether Greg will try to control the pace now that he's in the lead of the race. He certainly won't be thinking about victory speeches yet because there's many kilometres of track remaining. It's coming down to complete lap 14, so still six to go. And Andrew Booth, I think maybe he's made some adjustments to the brake bias. No in-cockpit adjustments other than the brake bias. There are no front rear anti-roll bars. And perhaps then just napping a bit because Kane Scott has moved up into second spot. I, I just wonder whether he lost perhaps or missed a gear there and there's that window still flapping it hasn't become any worse has it since the opening couple of laps there so it will be being looked at by the race stewards and if it starts to flap could well result in a penalty to come into the pits to remove that window let's not predict the doom for Kane Scott because he has enough going on at the moment with Andy Booth and Johnny Reed, standout performer of the new boys in a four-door sedan, doing a fantastic job there in position number four. One thing I'm a little bit puzzled about is how easy Kane Scott passed Andy Booth. And it was still in a straight line, actually, in a drag race. So, look, whether maybe Andy was a little bit slow on the throttle application coming onto the front straight, we both know it's a very long straight here. But, look, Kane done it almost too easy, I dare say. So maybe Andy Booth, man in the picture there, Quite possibly he's struggling for a little bit of straight line speed for one reason or another, but we'll certainly find out now if, uh, if Kane pulls away and if Johnny Reed, the man in the back of the pitch, can actually close right in on Andy Booth. And it's not a gear change point either because they're well and truly in sixth gear, the six speed sequential quafe gearbox in these cars. Now they don't actually reach match maximum revs because it's a fixed diff ratio in these cars of 3.25 to 1. They could top out at 270 if there was enough bitumen in front of them, but the straight here not quite long enough to do that, so a terminal speed of around 245 kilometres an hour as they head down into turn one. The peak antifreeze oil Commodore being engineered by Oscar Fiorinotto, a engineer from Australia that Kane became familiar with when he was spending time in the development series in Australia. And they've worked three all-nighters to get that car and all of the associated equipment ready for this weekend. It would be just as if that car could make it home in a valuable point scoring position. Of course, did start out of pole position, so it would be a role reversal, wouldn't it? Murphy qualified second, looking to win the race. Kane Scott from the pole position, currently second. Booth back to where he started, but he did lead the race well earlier on and still right through the field. These cars line astern. There's McIntyre behind the car of Pedersen, the second of the international motorsport machines. And behind the car of McIntyre is the recovering McLaughlin. And the quickest lap of the race is still resting with Greg Murphy, 1 minute 5.1. In fact, no, McLaughlin now, 105.0. So we're all but down to the qualifying times, bar half a second on these Hankook tyres that are now continuously been run for 16 laps, the first time that's happened. And a little bit of smoke I noticed too coming from the back of that car of Pedersen. I wonder whether maybe there's a panel rubbing there or it could well be another issue. There's the smoke coming from the side of that car. It's actually Eddie Bell's Eddie car. Bell, in fact, yes, correct. It's circulated. But one thing that's uh, has amazed, amazed me so far in this race is Kane Scott, when we look at the front of his car again, the front brake ducts are completely uh, blank right off. Okay, now that's a very important part of the car, especially when you're braking. No other car has that set up there, so whether they're backing themselves, you know, that it's created a little bit more downforce, and they thought that was more important than the recovery of the brakes, for any reason, I don't know, but here we are on board of Ant Peterson, you have to say he looks very relaxed, doesn't he? Does he ever? Having a little glance in the rear vision mirror, and why wouldn't he? Because he has the three-time champion, John McIntyre, honing in on the back. Hasn't been a greatest of day for John, has it? They're working through getting that car set up on the additional weight that the cars are now carrying. As I said, 1,390 kilos combined car and driver weight is around 50 kilograms more than what the anticipated weight limit would be. But, of course, that could not be determined until such time as each of the cars were weighed on the same set of scales here earlier on. So, Pedersen 
heading out of turn number one there. I love that corner, how it drops away and then it picks up aggressively on camber. It can be third or fourth gear, depending on the style of the driver. And then this little flick to the right and left where you're unsighted as you go over the rest of that uh, section of the circuit. And then what looks like a short run now down to turn number four is actually quite some time. I spent some time in my loan car during the course of the week driving around at 60 and 80 k's, a statutory suburban speed limit, and it took two minutes, 27 seconds to do it. That which would mean I'd be lapped five times by lap 11 by these cars. That's how quickly they're going. Right, and talk about quickly, how competitive is this race at this stage? We're talking about lap 18 of 20. The last lap around, the first nine cars were separated by 0.15 of a second. So there you go. So if we thought there's going to be a little bit of disparity or whatever amongst the cars, it is just not showing up in the overall lap times. And it's interesting to see that uh, 11 cars covered by around four, four tenths of a second. So despite the fact they are in different spots around the circuit, the actual speed coming from them shows just how close the racing is going to be. And I think once we get further into this weekend, when we get to about 10 laps from the final race and everybody wants to start scoring the big trophies, I just wonder whether or not there'll be some serious panel damage going on because the whole attitude coming into this week weekend was it's great to be here it's a fantastic achievement and a milestone event for this category let's go racing and put on a great show and they're putting on a great show but there's no better show than leaving here the race winner and I think that will intensify even further during the course of the weekend some rain has been forecast all weekend and we've seen none as we see a brake lock there by one of the cars there's Murph doing it well on his 19th lap of the race soon to start the last one in the Mike Perot mortgages machine red white and black Holden career throughout for this driver and Greg Murphy from position number two won't he be happy at race end if he can just complete the final remaining lap in this 20 lap race big margin too isn't it from first to second very comfortable only a disaster can befall Greg Murphy 39 year old driver who spent so long in Australia but has been loyal to his legion of fans here I can remember the first Pukekohe event he stayed in a motorhome just to ensure that he didn't have to worry about getting through the hordes and masses in and out of the circuit had so many personal appearances here as he flew the flag for New Zealand Motorsport. Well, what better way to fly the flag than in a homegrown product driving the V8 Super Tourer to come around and claim what's going to be the first win for the category with just a half a lap or so to go for car number 51. Still Scott in second, Booth in third, and the crowd starting to cheer on Greg Murphy. He's been absent for a while, but he's coming back in fine style and he will thoroughly enjoy this one. Not so sure it'll be quite as animated as that super single flying lap he did at Bathurst in the top 10 shootout back in 2003, but he'll be cheering nonetheless, as will the fans, as Greg Murphy for the final time exits turn number six, up through turn number seven, and at 240 kilometres an hour, takes the plaudits and takes, most importantly, the chequered flag. Murphy's back, back in style at Hampton Downs in the V8 Super Tourer. Second, Scott. Third booth. So those drivers finishing in the spots they started with as far as being in the top three spots. Murphy reversing the form there after challenging Andy Booth. Reed home in fourth. Baird a great drive into fifth. Andy Knight equally so into sixth. Bell, Pedersen, McIntyre, McLaughlin rounded out the top ten. And a very trim and slim and focused Greg Murphy enjoying the adulation and adoration of a very big crowd here at Hampton Downs. That was a very good drive, an entertaining race over in the blink of an eye as it always is, but Greg Murphy strikes first blood and goes into the history books as the first winner of a V8 Super Tour event. He certainly does it that, Chris, and it was a magnificent drive, wasn't it? But one thing that's just blown me away is how consistent these cars are. And even on the last lap, you know, we're looking at the timing monitor here, there's only 0.3 or 4 of a second amongst the first 9 or 10 cars. And matter of fact, Scott McLaughlin set a second fastest lap, fastest race time of the lap on the last lap so uh, these guys showed no signs at all but let's take nothing away from this man on screen now look he's shaking the car that's his way of saying ladies and gentlemen I'm Greg Murphy I've just won this race and I am a very very happy boy 100% finishing rate 16 cars started 16 cars finished and going into the history books will be car 51 G Murphy winner of race one Hampton Downs round one the 2012 V8 Super Tourers series now I don't think we're doing any tyre frying donut exhibitions here as he comes down to the podium area, the top three drivers and the crowd rightfully so giving him a good rap and he certainly delivers doesn't he when it really matters most and he'll be looking to take this form won't he back to the Clipsal 500 opening V8 supercar event 
And it's almost fairy tale like. I think he move, should move back here full time and just keep racing in New Zealand. Uh, I think the other 15 boats here in this championship are quite happy that he lives up the other side <laughs> of the Tasman because it, it might give him a bit of a chance later on in this magnificent all new Super Tour championship that we've got up and running. Hardly a dented panel, some rubbing, of course, early in the uh, race there. We saw a couple of incidents. Hard to know whether some of those drivers were making mistakes on their own. And this should be a fairly hearty cheer, I would have thought. Let's just look at the animation and composure of Greg. He's pretty happy, isn't he? Fantastic effort by Greg Murphy there, yeah, I'm it's, sure. It's not Pukekohe, mate, but uh, <laughs> what's it like to, to win again not so far down the road? Oh, mate, it is uh, it is it's fantastic. I mean, uh, this is just, you know, it's awesome to be in New Zealand and racing and, and uh, you know, winning's not bad either. So a uh, great little battle and, you know, just uh, fantastic to be a part of the series and, and be able to be here and do this. and. Great day and great, amazing crowd for turning up. Uh, they are, hopefully, we're giving them what they want and, and uh, you know, moving forward. Yeah, fantastic. Greg Murphy, he's certainly giving them what he, they want. And the Holden fans, well, are we happy? It's the top trio of cars. Murphy ahead of Scott and Andy Booth. And then a gaggle of Fords headed up by Johnny Reid. A very good drive from him. Craig Baird charging through from further down the order ahead of Knight. Bell, who did a good job as well to come home seventh. Pedersen in 8th, John McIntyre 13th to 9th, McLaughlin recovered from an early spin back up inside the top 10. The remaining six runners completed and they were Paul Manuel, Richard Moore, Steve Richards who struggled through after being at the rear as well, Corkery, Emery and Heim Gartner. So 16 cars started, 16 cars finished, but none finished better than Greg Murphy, the race winner.